Okay, uh, we're interviewing Mr. Andrew Hertz. Uh, this is tape one, 22 May 2001, the Lexington Avenue Armory in New York City. Uh, Mr. Hertz, uh, tell us uh, briefly uh, where, whereabouts you were born and raised. I was born in uh, Boston, Massachusetts in uh, 1921, October 28, 1921. Uh, my parents had come from uh, England my father was, was a Dutch uh, birth, my mother was, was born British, and uh, they settled in, uh, in Boston, at, by, first in Brooklyn, then in Boston, and I was born, I, I never remained there very long. Then we moved into New York City, uh, I don't remember exactly when, uh -huh. and that was about 1922-23. Okay, and, and you attended uh, elementary school? Elementary school schools in... Uh, in New York, but also of interest is my mother took us back to England at the, in 1927, I think it was. So I attended school for a short while in London, oh. in London, England, and, uh, as, as, did, as did my brothers, mm -hmm. a younger brother and an older brother. And then you came back here for high came school? Came back to, we settled in Brooklyn, in the Bensonhurst uh, uh, section of Brooklyn. And we moved a lot. Uh, my, my parents traveled, uh, I moved around the boroughs a lot. We lived in the Bronx, we lived in Queens. Uh -huh. So uh, we got a mixture of the, of the uh, area. Uh, we ended up though in Washington Heights in Manhattan. And uh, that's, where I, that's when I entered the service in 1941. Okay, uh, I see you entered the service uh, December 27th, 1941. That was right after Pearl Harbor. I, am, I went down to enlist the, uh, two days after, after Pearl Harbor at the 39 Whitehall Street. And the only reason I didn't go in earlier was the fact that I was a bit underweight and they wanted to make sure that I was able to, uh, uh, to perform in the service. So I had examinations at the uh, Naval uh, uh, Medical Facilities on, uh, I guess it was Barrack Street, or Ch uh, Church Street, I think it was. And then I went off to uh, Camp Upton and, December uh, 27th, 1941. Now, did you complete high school at that point? Oh yes, I completed high school, Stuyvesant High School here in New York City. Uh, I graduated from that in 1939. Uh -huh. and, and where did you go for basic training? Went to, uh, we went, well, we went out to uh, indoctrination, I guess, and we called it a Camp Upton. Uh, we left from Penn Station there's one, sec one section of the station, which is all, is all passed now. And we mm -hmm. travel out by train to Camp Upton, which is all the way out on, on uh, Long Island, Kachok. And we received our indoctrination there. We received our shots. We received our, uh, passed out, took our tests, our various tests that we were required to take, uh, physical and uh, uh, written tests. And uh, from there, we were assigned to various units. Uh, I, I was assigned from there to Fort Belvoir. Virginia. That was the Engineer Replacement Training Center. Okay, what was that training like? Well, that training was, was, it was, it was, it was interesting because during the middle of the training they decided we weren't going to use the methods that we, of training that we had been used up, uh, up through World War I. That was digging trenches, preparing trenches. The trenches were out because the Germans had, uh, if people recall, used the Butz uh, method uh, of, of fighting and very rapid movement. Mm -hmm. So the army also abandoned uh, trench, trench, trench warfare in the beginning of World War II. So our training was building, learning how to build bridges, pontoon bridges, uh, construction work. And uh, it was pretty rugged work because you, you, you did a winter when you were down there and we were exposed to the elements in the water, building mm -hmm. the pontons, uh, pontoon bridges, and uh, adjusting to the, to the army at that point. I did come down with pneumonia, which in a way uh, was very uh, opportune, I guess you might call it that, because the, unit, the people I'd been training with were shipped out to the Pacific, and I ended up, when I returned from the, uh, from the hospital, uh, I, went, I was assigned to a new outfit in uh, uh, Massachusetts, Westover Field. That was the, uh, the first of the, uh, one of the first of the uh, engineer aviation battalions, which were destined to perform jobs throughout the uh, war, war areas, uh, building and uh, reconstructing airfields. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you go from there? Well, from uh, Westover Field, the 
we, we, became, we began the organization of the battalion, which was a separate battalion, and in, uh, I guess it was June of 42, uh, we traveled from there to Fort Dix by motor convoy and by train. Uh, in fact, we remember coming down on the train to uh, New York City and then going out to uh, Fort Dix, where we were issued uh, our combat uniforms and combat materials. Up until then, for example, we, the hat that was used was, was called a campaign hat, which was uh, oh, yes. the, the, the cowboy style, like the cowboy mm -hmm. hat. Well, that was taken away from us. We were given overseas hats and, uh, and helmets to get ready for combat. And uh, we were there uh, until about the end of July and transported by train to uh, first Hoboken. Took a ferry from Hoboken to uh, Staten Island and boarded a ship called the West Point, which we discovered was actually the SS America, uh, which had been converted into a troop boat transport. The, uh, the America was one of, the, one of America's, I think the United States' largest liners at that time, the United States lines, mm -hmm. no longer exists. And we traveled on that ship, which became the flagship of a convoy, to um, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, there we picked up, an, uh, picked up a convoy of I think 30 or 40, maybe maybe more ships, but they included all types, including tankers and oils and whatnot. And uh, as a result, we had to travel as fast as the slowest ship, which took us about 14 days traveling up near Iceland and across into uh, England. What was it like on the ship? Was it really crowded? It was crowded. Uh, as a matter of fact, I I slept in the ballroom. The ballroom had been converted into tiers of of, uh, of cots, and I managed to get the one right at the bottom, so I was out, out of the cot and out to the deck as, as, as fast and often as I could every day. Mm -hmm. It was cold traveling because we were heading up toward Iceland. It was chill, very chilly. Uh, and we were escorted by uh, a number of cruisers and destroyers. We do know, we have no details of what happened, that there, had a, there was some type of a submarine activity because uh, well, the uh, destroyers bother us, they, they, they came around the ship to protect us as the flagship. And we did hear, hear, we heard, we didn't see, but we heard that there had been an attack by someone. Mm -hmm. We arrived in Liverpool, England, in, in the beginning of August, I guess. And our outfit was, the, the 834th Engineers, was the first one to disembark in Liverpool. Uh, this was interesting because Liverpool had been uh, subjected to a bombing during the, uh, during the Blitzkrieg. And uh, we saw the ruins of the, uh, of the homes and the businesses as we walked toward the railroad station. It developed that our outfit, as soon as we got off the ship, the air raid alarms went off. The Germans knew that the America, or the USS West, the West Point, was in Liverpool, and they came over, and the ship withdrew into the channel to avoid uh, bombardment. And uh, that was our first experience <laughs> arriving in England, we were subjected to an air, air attack. Uh, how heavy it was, I have no idea. We, were in the, we sat in the train all, all night until we, until we got the go-ahead to move down uh, to uh, the site that we had, that was selected to build our airfield. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 834th was an airfield, uh, an airfield battalion. It was, it was designed to uh, rehabilitate airfields, build, uh, build uh, emergency landing strips, build Rapid, rapid uh, fields uh, uh, under, under enemy flight. The, in Matching, we built a complete airfield. Matching, England was about 20 miles northeast of London, uh, in the area near Chelmsford. And uh, we built a complete airfield, including uh, uh, and huts, uh, that was the, the British term, we call them Quonset huts. These were uh, sort of inverted barrels of it looked like inverted barrels and uh, half barrels right. of, of corrugated steel with brick at, e at either end. And we built all those. We built the facilities for the, um, for the pilots, and for the crew people that would be coming in, uh, the runways, uh, 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 access roads. Now, those were probably pretty long runways oh, to, long uh, runway. to designed, accompany they, the... They were designed originally for the, for the long-term bombers, but actually uh -huh. they were used by the medium bombers of the 9th Air Force. Uh, we spent almost two years uh, uh, 
building that. Uh, now, were those uh, runways, were they concrete, concrete or asphalt? Concrete runways, concrete poured. Uh -huh. uh, incidentally, we did, get, we did get attacks from the Germans. The Germans did come over uh, almost, period, almost, almost every night. Uh, very, very little of an attack, but maybe a few, a few planes. They dropped a couple of bombs here and there. Uh, I, I heard them, <laughs> I was never, never, never affected by them. Uh, they knew we were there. This was uh, a section called East Anglia, which took the brunt of the, uh, of the uh, German hit and run attacks. Mm -hmm. Now, um, did, did you have much interaction with uh, the civilian population? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> there, there was a lot of, a lot of inter interaction. We had, uh, first of all, we adopted orphans, uh, uh, British orphans, as our, as our, each company adopted one. And we ran a party for them, a, a Christmas party with uh, Santa Claus, who they called uh, Father Christmas. Uh, one of our soldiers dressed up in that. We gave them treats, ice cream. And then the other GIs found the girls. We found the girls over there. Uh, the, we had dances, possibly once a month, or once or every two weeks. Uh, with the, uh, they brought in the, 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 the British equivalent of our wax. Uh, they were called the ATS, or they were called the, also the Waves, of the Air Force uh, women. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we had the we had civilians working with us on the. Uh, now, d did you do any flying at all, or no, no. strictly uh, we did no flying. construction? We did strictly construction and, uh, and building airfields. Uh, we were there until uh, the beginning of '44, and then they transport they transferred us to a place near Oxford, also for building and, and, and maintaining airfields, and also to get uh, uh, training in, in maneuvers on the field, closer. To Overnight, overnight kick. Uh, I forget the term we use for that. But overnight uh, trips we made uh, uh -huh. with our packs, four packs, and, uh, in the hills near uh, near Oxford. And then we went back to matching just for a short time. To uh, by that time the air for the air field, the air force had moved in and taken over. We would really put up in tents uh, during that period, uh, and then. The, then we became what is called bigoted personnel. That was a term they used for people who were aware of the impending invasion and had any details. I see. So well, we were taken from there. Uh, we, we went down to Torquay on the southwest British coast to, for maneuvers, uh, 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 boat landings, uh, and uh, getting our vehicles process uh, uh, waterproofed uh -huh. so they could be able to cut them on, on the beach. So we knew that we were going to go into a beach of some sort, but we didn't have enough food, food we could. And from that Torquay, we moved down, then down into uh, southern England, southwestern England, uh, and we uh, were put up in, uh, in huts to uh, prepare for the invasion. At that time, we were given a little bit, little of details. We weren't given dates, mm -hmm. and until the day before, I guess we moved on to uh, moved into Wales and boarded a uh, Liberty ship called Scripps, which was uh, packed with both with our uh, with an element of our outfit, but we were the headquarters company. I was in the headquarters company. But other other elements of the battalion, the construction people, the, the ones who had the Pair the, uh, the airstrips. Uh, they, they they were placed in a uh, in different areas. We were supposed to be a support outfit, a support element that would come in uh, some hours after the invasion. The other groups were supposed to go in with the first waves. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we traveled on the scripts, but with us on the scripts were some uh, uh, rangers, sort troops uh, to cross the channel. The invasion, you may or may not have known, was supposed to have occurred on June 5th, 1944. We were on the water at that time. And the, uh, the waters were so bad, that, and the st and storm was so bad, that Eisenhower uh, postponed the invasion. But we were on the water. Uh -huh. We sailed all the way from Wales around. We were on the water on June 5th uh, during that storm. Uh, 
I, I must have a very good stomach because I was one of the, the few GIs who wasn't seasick. They were all down in the hold of the Liberty ship. And I was up upstairs with the uh, crew in their little uh, canteen, having e eating, having coffee and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I had it easy. As a matter of fact, I was there when we first heard the invasion. We heard the German reports on, on, the, on the night of June the 5th. I guess after midnight, that uh, it, uh, paratroops were dropping in on Normandy. And that was the first knowledge that we had that the invasion was actually on. Uh, then we uh, uh, arrived off the coast of uh, Normandy, uh, near Vierville, and we could see it was under fire uh, the, by the Germans and by the, uh, the uh, uh, warships were, were hoisting shells onto the, and into the backfield of the, uh, of the uh, invasion beaches. In fact, one of the battleships was in Texas. That was the one that waved us when we finally did go in. Uh, at the point of uh, waiting to go in, we couldn't get in on the, on the day, on, on June the 6th. We stayed out in the water until later in, late in the morning, and we, we finally had a LST, that's a landing ship tank, a landing, uh, LCT, a landing craft tank, came alongside and the uh, lieutenant on board, or the ensign on board, requested some flour and water and the, from the ship. And they gave it to him. He said, I can take in about 90 men. And now the uh, commanding officer, or the officer in charge of the group, said, I have 90 men for you. Uh, I can send them in. But in the meantime, the fellow on the rangers said, you pass. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want any part of it yet, so we scrambled down these nets, the uh, scramble nets, onto the uh, uh, LCT, and, it, and because the water was rough, it was rising and falling. Uh, I I dangled at the end of the net and finally finally dropped about six feet onto the ship. I wasn't hurt, but it, it was I was supported by a few uh, GIs that came down, and then we, we traveled in. I guess we got in about June time on June seventh. Did you encounter any resistance at all at that point? Yeah, on, on the beach we had, it was, it had the beaches hadn't been secured. This was Omaha Easy Red. That was the beach that took the beating. Uh, the LCT let us off in about six feet of water, so I staggered in with my backpack, which was a 60 pound pack, holding my carbine. I didn't have a rifle, I had a carbine as an uh -huh. LCT. And I held that above my head and uh, scrambled in. It was the very first time I'd, I'd ever seen a dead person. GIs floating around in the water. Uh, we got onto the beach and we had to lie down low because the, they were still showing. What the, what the Germans had, uh, they had 88s planted in the back of the cliffs and they were lobbing these shells onto the beach at this late stage on, on June 7th. So, so uh, we, we laid there for oh, several hours, I guess. We did have an encounter with a one lone German plane came over uh, doing a little strafing, but it, it didn't affect us. It was out over. He tried the beaches, but I guess he couldn't get in close because they were firing at, firing mm -hmm. at him. And uh, then we started uh, in, and uh, uh, it was amusing that the, the beach man asked us what kind of troops we were. We told him they were engineers. He says, good, we need, we need some of you fellows up ahead to, to blow out some, uh, some wire, like this, some barbed wire so we can get through. So one of our sergeants said, you got the wrong guys. We're, we're Air, Air Force engineers, and we're, we're here to build an airfield. He said, who sent you in? He said, oh, some son of a bee on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on an LCT. That was our, our supply sergeant told us that. Then he discovered that we were mostly uh, headquarters personnel, typists. Uh, and heavy equipment operators. Well, we, didn't have, we, had, we didn't have the heavy equipment yet. They, were still, they, were still, they didn't have not come ashore yet. As a matter of fact, the serials that were supposed to precede us in, the units that were supposed to precede us, came in after we did. So it was in fact kind of a mix-up on, on, the, on the beach. We finally did get through, and it was an amazing thing. We came in about noontime, but it, the night seemed to come in so quickly. And, and these were long days, it was summertime, June. And it seemed that the night came in so, so very quickly. We, we climbed up the up a hill road leading up, and there were bombed out, uh, burnt out trucks along the, along the road with unfortunate, unfortunately some GIs built out over the we got to the top and our officers had us lie down in the ditch alongside the road. We spent the night there. 
Matter of fact, I spent the night alongside a, uh, a member of the 116th Engineer, uh, on the 16th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Division. That was the one that was decimated. They, they took the main assault the day before. And uh, he told me that he, don't, he didn't take any more than 20 or 30 of his, of his fellow battalion members. The regiment had, had survived that. Mm -hmm. that was, that was what they call Bloody Omaha, that beach. And uh, I should describe the beach. The beach was a, lot, was a high cliff, something like the, like the Palisades we have in, in New Jersey, overlooking the beach. And it had been honeycombed by the Germans with a, a sniper, uh, sniper posts. Well, they had been knocked out eventually by the time we got up the hill. But we stayed up, we, st we, we were there on the top of the hill all night. And then they moved us into a sort of a, an area behind a, uh, behind hedgerows, and a lot of a lot of bodies there, a lot of GIs, and some Germans as well. Mm -hmm. And we uh, put up our little pup tents and stayed there for a couple of days. And uh, we, I'm subjected to sniper fire. There was a church not too far off, and the Germans had been on top of a, uh, it was steeple firing down at us. Until they, that finally went down. Uh, some GIs from our, my outfit captured some German soldiers, brought them in. The amazing thing was that most of them were 12, 14 year old kids. Really? There were a few elderly men in there. The, the Germans did not really have at that point, at that on uh, the beach itself, the, the first rate troops. They came in later on on the counter attack. Did your group suffer any casualties at all? The fellow in front of me as we came up the beach was shot. He, he suffered some uh, leg injuries and rejoined the outfit several months later. He was a supply, a supply sergeant. <laughs> but that was that was the only one at that at that point. We did suffer some casualties later on. Uh, thank the uh, commander of the of the uh, regiment to, and his uh, and executive officer were killed on the way to Paris uh, later on. Colonel Little and uh, uh, Colonel Park, so was his name. Did you uh, have to travel through any of the hedgerows? What's that? Did you have to travel through any of the hedgerows? We, we were, we were, Actually, the hedgerows were a protection for us as, as a unit because it protected us from, the, from, the, from German sniper fire. But the fellows on the beach, the fellows who, went, who came ashore with the, with the equipment to, to clear, the, clear the beach, they were subjected to, uh, to some fire. Uh, and they had that first beach available the, uh, the next day, the morning of June the 8th. They were flying out wounded soldiers. C-47s C came in and took a look from them. Earned us, that earned us the presidential citation because they built that, that first field on the fire. Mm -hmm. There was other fields built later on, but that was the, the, the big field uh, of evacuation. Several days later, we were on top of the hill. We walked, uh, uh, we walked, we walked several miles to a point at a place called Saint Pierre uh, Dumont, where we built a, a real large uh, fighter. Now, how long did it take you to build that? Uh, they did it very quickly. It was about three or four days, I would say. They, they, they did not use concrete on there, of course. They used what they called uh, these metal uh, 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 they're like, uh, like a landing mat or uh, like, PSP? Like a mat, a mesh, uh, 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 a, a, a steel mat, mat so they, mm -hmm. you know, they interlock, interlock, something like an erector set. That's what they reminded me of, large erector sets. Now, what kind of planes uh, came in? Uh, fighter planes. Uh, 47s, P-47s, and the 51s came in there, too. Mm -hmm. I remember all the, all the planes, but the fighter planes came in. They told, in fact, they, the pilots would tell us what was happening up, up ahead as the, as the uh, battle proceeded. We were there, and on, um, uh, well, about a week or so later, after we built the airfield, we moved to a place called Lee Molay and built a large Air, what do you call a supply depot type of thing with large hangars. And, uh, and then uh, we remained in that area for, for several weeks until a breakout. We went down to, uh, we traveled down to uh, our branch, uh, which was right near St. Uh, what's the name of the, the mountain? St. Uh, I forget the name. I, th I think I showed you a picture of it earlier today. The, uh, uh, oh, so Saint Mahal? Uh, uh, Saint Mont 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 Saint Michel. I Michel. get the names here. And uh, we were right there. In fact, I, uh, uh, 
and I had two other fellows got in there first. We got into that town the first time. It was it was unusual. And uh, then one of uh, one of our units, uh, one of our surveyor groups, uh, went to um, the Brittany Peninsula, uh, and they were the first to, first actually first soldiers to get out get out to the Brittany Peninsula, which was still under German control. The Germans attacked uh, sporadically uh, while we were there. Uh, in uh, they, they finally the our force of arms and the air, the air power, I think, is what drove them. They had no they had no air power left. We, we attacked them with it, and uh, we proceeded on. And, uh, I got to Paris a couple of days after the liberation, because I went out with my radio man. I'm a communication sergeant. I went out with my radio man to see if we could find some parts, and we ended up at uh, uh, Le Bourget Air Airport uh, to pick up things. And we could, therefore, we were in Paris about two days after the, uh, after the French took the city. Uh -huh. How long were you there for? Oh, I was just to do this the other day. We got we went back again to the outfit, uh, not too long because then we moved up to Belgium as the as the unit proceeded, and we ended up at a place called Saint Tron, which is north of Liège. The, the, the the large the large cities. Okay, I just wanted to stop at all that fire truck went by. Uh, the uh, Liège was one of the large cities. It was one of the first city, big cities that fell to the Germans during the. 1940, 1940 invasion of the, of the lowlands. Uh, we built an airfield, we, we, not built, we uh, rehabilitated an airfield at St. Tron. In fact, we were put up in a girls' uh, dormitory, a girls', a girls school up there. Uh, and uh, the inter one of the interesting things was on October the 2nd, a, uh, a large explosion uh, uh, took place, damaging our runway, uh, creating a tremendous hole I guess about 30 or 40 feet across. We didn't know what it was at first, but it was discovered to be the first German V2 or rocket that was fired at the, uh, at the Allies. And that landed on the runway, brought in all kinds of uh, security and uh, intelligence people, and they discovered that it was what it was. Hmm. The following day, Antwerp was struck, and then after that, London and other English cities were struck. I think that was the first use of, uh, of rockets in, uh, in wartime. That must have, must have uh, panicked a lot of people. It did. It did. That was because you could not hear a, a V2 coming. The V1 was the uh, buzz bomb, which, which had a pop, 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 pop sound. And when the pop, 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 pop stopped, then the explosion went off. There were a few landed in Normandy, but I, I wasn't exposed to them. Mm -hmm. but they landed in England, quite a few. And of course, the V2s came. Fortunately, they did not last too long because by that time, the, the, the Americans, the British, had overrun the launching sites. And that was the end of that. Hmm. Now, whereabouts did you go next? Well, from there, we were brought back to, re to uh, reconstruct uh, airfields near Beauvais and Pontoise in France on the Oise River. And, and when we were pulled back, we were pulled back in November, and we were there when the uh, Germans attacked the Bulge, which would have cut us off had we been, had we still been up in St. Tron. No, this was in 1944. 1944, December 44, right. And uh, we were there until, until the Germans were, were uh, thrown back from the Bulge, from the airfield. But when their group was, was stopped, when was stopped. And I would say some beginning of the early part of the year, we traveled into Germany. Now, were you guys uh, like staying in pup tents or? Well, no, we, we, we took over. We took over, uh, for example, in Beauvais, we used to be in the chateau. Uh, no, we were in pup tents. We, were in, uh, we took over whatever quarters were that? necessary at that point. Uh, I, I think it was in March. Yes, March we were in, uh, we went to, we, we traveled in, in through Cologne, which was battered by the, by the army, and down to a place called Koblenz. And we took over a, uh, a, a, a soft drink factory as a headquarters. And this is, this is true. 
A few days after we were there, a Coca-Cola representative showed up to convert it to a Coca-Cola. No, for a fellowship. This is true. They did. At that time, we were out. And I was, uh, I was ill. I was in a hospital in uh, Bonn. Bonn. When uh, Roosevelt died. Uh, April the 12th. Now, what were you in the hospital for? I had a colitis condition. Oh. So, and uh, that same day, one of my... Officer, one of the officers came up and said, we're moving out into Germany. Uh, and, 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 you'll have to come and get out. So I, I was released from the hospital, went back to the Abbott, and we traveled across Germany, uh, following the, uh, the infantry. And uh, for the first time, we saw what had happened to uh, in that country. Uh, coming, streaming in, in our direction as we went, went east, we were, uh, uh, concentration camp, Victims coming by, they had flags made, American flags made out of, out of sheets that they painted themselves, and they were marching with their belongings and carriages, whatever they could carry. Uh, in, in very, very sad shape. They were, of course, coming to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I got to see uh, one of the concentration camps on the way out. I, I managed to get to visit. For the first time, I realized the enormity of what Hitler had done to the Jews in, in, in Germany and in Europe. Do you remember what uh, camp that was? I can't remember the name. It was a camp we went to. And it may not have been an extermination camp, but bodies were piled up outside. Uh, I don't recall the actual name of it. It, it slips my mind now. Okay. Uh, it, it wasn't the same one that, it wasn't Buchenwald, where Eisenhower was. It Eisenhower. Do, was it Dachau, was it? No. Dachau, I did visit later on when we, when we, when we, got, we arrived at a place called Firth in Germany, uh, which was near Nuremberg, and, and I, took some, I took a trip there and saw that. But uh, we saw some of what had been done. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the strange thing was, I, I was aware of, of Hitler. I was, I was stunned when I heard what the, the persecution of the Jews that were taking place. In, in Germany before that time, as a young kid, because if you recall, he started up in the 1930s. And I was just a young boy then. Right. And I was, uh, they used to broadcast some uh, programs. There was a program on, uh, on one, of the, one of the radio stations, uh, radio stations, we didn't have TV, called Five Star Final, in which they depicted what was happening to, to Jews, the persecution, the taking away their citizenship, and so forth. So I knew this, this type of thing, but I could never have dreamt that extremes to which these people, my, my people actually subjected to. I do know my father took a trip some years later to a uh, home and said that most of, most of our family was right down. The family that wasn't Holland, I did not know that, but that was right down. That was one of the experiences we had. Now at that point, uh, the war had ended? No, we were, we were constructing a fields, we, we moved from we went to a town called Erfurt, which was in the eastern zone, which the Russians were taking over. And then we went down to a, a Nuremberg at a place called Firth, where we built more airfields. It was there that the war ended, that we got the news that the uh, Germans had surrendered. We had first got the news that Hitler had committed suicide, and then we got the news that the war had ended. Uh, at that point, we were more, more or less uh, an army of occupation then, and uh, cleaning up the airfields. I had the opportunity of attending a university in uh, Biarritz, France, which was run by the Army, called the Army University of Biarritz. And I, I attended classes there. And it was there that we heard the news of the uh, Japanese surrender. Oh. Okay. We were there quite some time afterwards. Uh, and, and the interesting thing was that we had expected to be shipped there because, uh, not, not us, we expected our outfit to be shipped there because they were taking troops from Europe and shipping it out there. Well, we were felt fairly safe because we had very high points. Points were awarded on the basis of time overseas, time in combat, uh, medals and decorations we received. And uh, since we received decorations, we received presidential citations, it's all accumulated. So we had well over 100 points, which was enough to have us uh, return to the States. Now, at that point, how long had you been overseas? I've been overseas, I think it came out to 38 months, uh, th uh, 42, 
43, 44, 45. I think it was 38 months altogether. Yeah, I think it was 38 months overseas. Now, at that point, were most of the fellows you went over with, were you all together, or did you go to all different units, or well, what happened? Well, at that point, since I, when I returned to the outfit from, from Via Ritz, uh, and at this point, we were stationed in the town of Schweinfurt, which had was a ball bearing uh, mm -hmm. citadel of the German army. They had, we had been there. My outfit, had, most of my members of my outfit had been shipped out for, re, for uh, re, uh, relocation to the States. So I missed them. Uh, they went to camps in, in France called Cigarette Camps, because they were named Lucky Strike, Chesterfield, the Fort Morris. Um, but I missed them. All, of, all that was left there was a cadre of, of a few officers. So I wangled a trip uh, to uh, England. C-47, first time I'd ever flown, and uh, I went to, uh, uh, flown to Wolverhampton, Wolverhampton, I think it was called, right outside of Wolverhampton, and there I, uh, we, we got acclimated to going home, we took away uh, some of our uniform that we didn't require any longer, helmets and so forth, and we gave the shots again, and uh, we had to fill out papers, pay and so forth. No, you were there with like your platoon or company? Uh, or? It was just, just loosely assigned. Just, just I, a handful. I was a sergeant, so I was with, with, that, with NCOs uh -huh. in, in that particular outfit. And uh, I guess we were there about a week or 10 days, and then they shipped us down to Southampton, and I boarded the Aquitaine. And there must have been, I don't know how many thousands of board troops, uh, but no cargo because it was returning from the Europe. So we sailed across the Aquitania, sleeping again in the bunks. I think I slept again in the ball in the ball. And uh, when we arrived in New York, we anchored off, uh, off, off in, the, in, the, in, in the upper bay until the tide could allow us to come up. And then we sailed up. And the interesting thing was that since the ship was empty, it had no, it had no cargo. All the GIs on board, most of them had never been to New York, they all rushed to the starboard side to look at the skyline. When that happened, the ship tilted. Wow. So we were coming up at an angle. So the uh, British captain came on, came on the loudspeaker to advise, uh, you GIs, get on to the other side. Some of you on the other side, our sh ship is coming in at a very acute angle, and it's not in dignity with his Majesty's Navy. <laughs> now, do you recall what date that was? It was October 2nd. I believe, uh, 1945. Okay. I know the World Series had just started. That's how I remember it. I was sitting up on the deck when the, uh, when the World Series was being played. Uh -huh. Cubs and the Tigers, I think. Okay. Um, at, at that point, uh, where did you go? Once, once we, you... we went from there. Uh, we boarded, um, we boarded the, uh, uh, we disembarked in New York. The Red Cross getting us coffee and cake and donuts. And we again traveled across by ferry to uh, New Jersey and we transported by train to uh, Fort Dix. Fort Dix, we were going to be de 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 uh, demotorized. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop the tape here. Okay, this is uh, tape two with. Uh, Mr. Andrew Hertz. Uh, Mr. Hertz, uh, let me just uh, go back for a moment to uh, when Germany surrendered. Yes. What, what was the mood of uh, your, yourself and your fellow soldiers? Was, that, was there a lot of celebration? Of course, uh, it was, we were exhilarated. Uh, people shot off guns and the uh, rifles and whatnot uh, when, when the news came in that the, the war was over mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Europe. We just figured we'd be going home very soon, but we knew, we, we knew about Japan, and we just had to wait to see what would happen then. Right. But actually, we were there for quite some time. See, we were there from May, uh, I think May 8th, the, uh, was the VE day, VE day was May 8th, and I didn't get home until uh, mm -hmm. beginning of October. And uh, was there any talk at all about possibly being sent to the Pacific? Well, we figured there was talk of it, but most of the uh, troops in my outfit built up a lot of points because of 
fact that he's been in the uh, overseas for so long, each each month was a point, and then it will give you points for the decorations. You see the presidential unit citation, the European theater uh, decoration, uh, middle uh, middle uh, east European uh, decoration, German uh, decoration. So all these things built up points. So we felt we felt that we would be going home. Instead of going to the Pacific, but we didn't know just when. And don't forget, Japan was still fighting, so right. we had no idea what would be. But when, when uh, Japan surrendered in the middle of September, then we figured we, we, that was it. But strangely enough, some of the uh, troops who had been uh, uh, sent back to the States for reshipment to the Far East got out of the army before we did, because they were at the home of Japan when uh, the war ended. Now, uh, once Germany surrendered, uh I mean, what what did you do during the daytime? Did you? Uh... Well, there was still work to be done. You had to have duties. I had to go to the university in Biarritz, uh -huh. uh, so I was out of that for a couple of, uh, for, for quite quite a few weeks. And down in Biarritz, when uh, uh, that's when I was there when the Japanese surrendered, and uh, others had duties. You had normal. Uh, for, uh, so you you weren't. Uh, Building any more airfields uh, then, or probably we were maintaining those, uh -huh. we're not building it, but maintaining them. And uh, uh, that, that pretty much it. I, I can't describe in any detail what we were doing because I don't uh -huh. recall it all. But we were just uh, garrison troops actually at that point. Okay. And, and once you got back to the states, uh, well, we arrived, as uh, I say, in, uh, in New York. We, we were transferred to Camp Kilmer for just a day or so. Now, whereabouts is Camp Kilmer? Camp, Camp Kilmer is where Rutgers University is, uh, uh, one of the branches of Rutgers University. In fact, there's, there's a school at, at Camp Kilmer now. In fact, I attended uh, quick uh, classes on there when I went for my master's degree at the, at the same site. And from Camp Kilmer, we went to Fort Dix for uh, discharge. Okay, and, and once you were discharged, uh, you went well, back home? Well, uh, let me just tell you a little story, though. Uh, uh, we were there about seven or eight days, I guess. And my mother and my brothers came out to see me at Fort Dix. And uh, then when they took away all of our accoutrements, uh, uniforms and whatnot, then uh, we received our discharge. And we individually, we went to the station to come home. And that was in Trenton. Fort Dix took a bus to Trenton. On the platform at Trenton, we met um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who had been speaking to a group of students. And uh, we went over, in fact, I, I went over and, and expressed my sympathy at, at, at uh, Roosevelt's death earlier in the year. And the, one of the GIs I was with presented her with his discharge paper and had her autograph it. <laughs> but I was a little too chicken to ask. But, and then she rode into it, she rode in the train with us to, to oh. New York. When I came back, I had a few few weeks off, and then I, I went back into the printing industry, which I had worked in before. And I was in the printing industry until, uh, uh, on and off until 1974, when I, when I discovered uh, that a, a school was opening in Hudson County. I lived in New Jersey at that point. Uh -huh. uh, in um, Hudson County, a vocational technology school uh, as a team. I applied for a job as a teacher of printing, which I, I obtained. And I was a teacher there for, uh, until, until my uh, uh, retirement in 1987. I, I, while, while I was there at, uh, at teaching, I took courses at, uh, at uh, the City University of New York's, uh, uh, State University of New York, Empire State College, which is an external degree program. Right. For which I received some credit for uh, courses that I had uh, taken uh, along the way, the Beeritz courses, the courses at NYU I had taken, and then uh, credit for experience of life. And since I had the experience of the war and the Depression years, uh, it became uh, a, an interesting part of my education. And they accepted the, they accepted the, a, a, uh, we call a portfolio of experience, and uh, I received my degree, uh, bachelor's degree in uh, education at SUNY. Now what year was this? 
1970, it's 1978 to 79. Okay. And, and, I took, and I went to Rutgers University for a graduate degree in, in education, graduate school of education. And, uh, I, I, I should mention along the way that uh, so I did receive the uh, honor of uh, Teacher of the Year for Vocational Education. Eastern half of the United States. Oh, wonderful. Uh, American, uh, American uh, Vocational Association, and also principal of distinction from the, uh, uh, forget which one it was, in New York, in uh, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Now, did you get married? Yes, I could tell you about my, <laughs> I was married in 1948, met my wife in the mountains, out in the Adirondacks. Uh, married in 1948, makes us 53 years now. We have a, had a son born in 1950. He's now the deputy chief counsel in the uh, uh, pension department in the United States. And I have a daughter, Reba, who was born in 1954. She is the uh, deputy sports editor on the San Francisco Chronicle. So really? Ways for her. <laughs> uh, so she's been she's been in jail as uh, Both my students, both of my children went to the University of Michigan. Uh huh. Again, the residential college which we just instituted with my son was going there. And uh, they both did very well in school. Any uh, grandchildren? No grandchildren, unfortunately. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, is there anything that stands out uh, in particular? Uh, that anything that's, uh, any experiences that are most memorable? During your uh, war years? Well, during the war years, I think the, the concentration camps really struck me. The, the, of course, going in on that invasion, I could never, never forget something like that. Mm -hmm. it, it was, I, I, I can visualize it to this day exactly as it was. And this is from 50, 57 years later. It's so, it's so, so immense in my mind. I, I, I can even dream about it. So. Must have been a lot of anxiety amongst it everyone. It was anxiety, but the strange thing was, I, I don't remember the fear. I don't remember having, I was anxious, but I don't remember having fear going in. That's, that's the strange part, but I think back on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, some, some of us were, they were very fearful. I, I, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I, I just don't remember having fear. It was, it was a, a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps somehow I didn't expect that people would be shooting at me. <laughs> Okay, so I take it it was uh, overall it was a, a worthwhile experience. It was a worth. It shouldn't have been, but it was a worthwhile mm -hmm. experience in my life. And, uh, uh, was, of course, my most memorable, my most, my, my, my greatest experience, of course, is having wife and two children. Mm -hmm. uh, do you keep in touch with any of the soldiers you yes, served with? Yes, in fact, I. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, most of them have passed away. I was in touch with a buddy of mine who lived in Baltimore. He died a few years ago. Uh, but I do have a, a friend who was in the uh, in the Alpha, uh, Sandy Conti, who happens to live here in Manhattan. And, and he was the fellow who managed to get a bronze, uh, bronze leaf on his presidential citation because he was with the group, with the unit that went into, uh, into uh, Brittany, the first troops to get into Brittany, accidentally. He was here. I'm in touch with him. In fact, he was uh -huh. at my house last week. Do you belong to any uh, veterans organization? I belong so? to the American uh, Ninth Air Force Association. That's what that uh -huh. was okay. uh, Other than that, no. Okay. Uh, any final thoughts? No, no final thoughts. I, I, I just say we just have to hope that nothing like this ever happens again. Uh, a war of this measure with the kind of brutality that exists. Uh, it's. It, it, it was a horrendous time, really, when, when you think about it. But in, in many respects, it was a good time and that people thought of one another during the war years. Mm -hmm. Both here and in England, we were I'm very impressed with the way the British stood up to this. We were living with them for two years. And sure. And so, but the people at home, too, they, they made a, there was a difference in attitude that, that, that I don't think they have today. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess uh, this is a good place to stop. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.